You are listening to the Mindset Forge podcast. My name is Barton Bryan, your host. I'm interviewing athletes and performing artists on how they show up for the big moments. Uh, today, I'm interviewing Ben Odom. He and his buddy Matt literally rode across the entire Atlantic Ocean in 50 days. It's an epic tale, an epic journey. There's actually a race that he got, they got they were a part of. They did last year around this time. He talks about how his friend kind of teased him with this idea. And over the course of a year or so, it really kind of took shape why he chose to do it. All the twists and turns along the way. And then finding himself and his friend rowing into Antigua and seeing like the end right in sight. And just the, the joy, the pain, the agony that it took to get to that point. And so it's just a beautiful interview. Ben is an awesome dude. So check it out. Enjoy this. Lots of mindset uh, concepts that you'll see along the way that he talks about in regards to the endurance, preparation, teamwork, and just understanding what it takes to endure 50 days on the high seas in a small rowing boat. So without further ado, Ben Odin. Well, Ben, hey, thanks for being on. I'm really excited to talk to you. There's so much about this whole sport and what you did and just the bravery and, and just badassness that you were a part of that I, I can't wait to, to share with the audience here. Uh, but give us a 30,000 foot view. What is, what is it like to go across the Atlantic 50 days rowing with your buddy, Matt, take us through that overall experience. Well, someone once said you're ready to row the ocean once you rowed it once. And I wholeheartedly agree with that after having done it. And there's really, Nothing I could say that would really distill the, the experience to you without you doing it yourself, but I'll give it my best. It combines a lot of aspects of outback camping with an endurance sport. And it's, it's pretty much not red line activity. Most of the time, it's just below 150, uh, pul you know, heart rate rowing, but it's, it's just nonstop. It, it doesn't stop for, for 50 days. And your body adapts and you have great experiences in the meantime. And every day is a roller coaster. I mean, literally every day you experience highs and lows that are higher and lower than your average day. And that's, uh, the, the beauty of it is, is eight months out from it. I mostly only remember the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, give us, give us more perspective. Uh, we start in the Canary islands, correct. And go across to, uh, <clears throat> across the entire Atlantic, like tell, talk about how that whole race is set up and, and just some of the history behind it. The, the race itself is inspired by early ocean rowing crossers that did these in open wooden rowing boats. Now that is something I would never do, but in the, in the early two thousands, Woodvale was a company that started putting on the race and they provided wooden kits for, for rowers to build on their own and and execute this race i would also rather not do that in the last 10 years what's happened is a company called atlantic campaigns now operates and organizes the race talisker whiskey is the title sponsor so it's the talisker whiskey atlantic challenge and every year on december 12th the a fleet of anywhere from 20 to 37 i think 37 was the biggest year so far 37 boats will leave from La Gomera, an island in the Canaries, and cross unsupported 3,000 miles roughly to Antigua in the Caribbean. And the, the boats, the, the current boats are anywhere from 25 to 30 foot long ocean rowing boats, most of them made out of carbon fiber uh, hulls. So they're very light, very strong, and very well, like very safe. The, uh, if you do two things, if you only remember two things to do, it's to stay tethered to the boat at all times that you're on the deck and to keep the hatches closed when you're on deck as well. And if you do that, really these, these boats are bulletproof and they'll keep you safe the whole way over. So, and, and I'll put, I'll put a reference in the show notes so y'all can kind of click on it and see some video and some pictures of these boats, but explain kind of the, you're rowing in the middle and then you've got your, each of you have a kind of a hatch or a cabin you kind of crawl into talk about just the, how that's all set up. That's right. So these boats dry, at least a, the two man boat that we piloted across was about 700 pounds dry. So 
very, very light boat that we could push around on a trailer just by ourselves. Once all the gear, the gear and your, and the two rowers at least outweighs that by a factor of two. And so the, as you mentioned, the, though the boats are 25 feet long, the rowing deck is more narrow and shorter. So that's only about eight to nine feet long, the rowing deck. And so really when the two of you, now you can do this in different configurations for teams. We did it in a pairs. There are soloists all the way up to five person teams, but the most common are soloists, pairs, and teams of four. So in a pairs team, most of the time during the day, there were two of us on deck pretty close. And, um, one of us is rowing at any given time. The other one resting, doing some cooking, doing some chores. And then, as you mentioned, either side has a cabin with a hatch that can close and be watertight. It's not completely airtight because you want some air to be able to move around, but it's a, it's a one way valve more or less that just lets, uh, some air to, to move through. It's very stuffy in there, but it, uh, it does the job and, uh, it works, works pretty well. The size of the cabins, I'm a, I'm six foot three and I was able to fit my entire body in there, but my head was touching the edge and my feet were touching the other end of the cabin. <laughs> and, uh, so no very, room for being claustrophobic. Oh yeah. Now you get over that really quickly. It's, it's really like the size of a small pup tent. Yeah. And so you can't, I can't stand up in there. You know, I can barely sit up without hitting my head on something. So it's mm -hmm. very you have like, you have to get dressed in there when the, when there's weather outside, you have to get in your foul weather clothing, pretty much laying down and maneuvering, uh, hmm. that, that was difficult. All right. Well, so one of the things I was just thinking about constantly, every time I would watch a video about whether it's you guys or another crew that went through just huge waves. I mean, obviously <laughs> in the Atlantic ocean, you're talking about possible storms, hurricane, uh, you know, wave, like 30 foot waves. You're in this little tiny, 25 feet sounds big to us, <laughs> you know, but that's a very small vessel in these monstrous like storms and such like yeah. what's happening. Like, how are you guys getting through that? Do you just hunker down and like get in your cabins and just wait it out? Like talk about that. Yeah. Well, the joke is the waves get bigger as time goes on in your memory. Um, and every, <laughs> There's every crossing, feet. <laughs> yeah. every crossing is different and each rower's experience is different even within a race because the, the micro weather you experience is pretty remarkable. So mm -hmm. we could be having a squall and then even 10 miles away, a team experiencing sunlight and fair weather. Our year was considered a relatively slow year, meaning that the storms and the wind was not as intense as it has been. The weather plays a very big part in the speed of the general crossing. So the, when records are set, those are fast years where the weather is a little bit scary and very fast pushing east to west. Mm -hmm. Our, during our crossing, we really had about five total days where there were waves that kind of had me on edge and you know, I can only speak to you relative to, to our experience. I think the highest we saw were somewhere in the 25 foot, uh, waves. Mm -hmm. And most of the time these were not breaking waves. The only breaking waves we experienced were what I would call rogue waves, where you just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And a wave forms, uh, against the pattern of the prevailing waves and, and current. Mm -hmm. And it just hits you out of nowhere and just drenches the boat. And we had one of those nearly capsizes or put us on edge, right. but the, the boats are ballasted with the emergency drinking water on the, mm -hmm. on the bottom of our storage. So it's actually quite, it's the boat itself is very tippy, but only to a certain point. Once you get to about 30 degrees of tilt, it's very hard to push it the other, uh, way to, to actually tip it over. Right. So you, just like with a roller coaster, the first time you ride it, you, you experience fear and a thrill, but if you've ridden it 30 times, you know, okay, this is, this is what it feels like. And I would say that once, once we had been on some of these bigger swells, it was fun. You know, it was more of a feeling of excitement, like, Ooh, cool. We're going to surf down the edge of the swell yeah. and you could feel the boat accelerate. And it was, it was more of like 
sticking your head out of the window of a fast car. It felt fun and you look forward to it and you, and you trusted the boat to perform like it's supposed to. Yeah. Well, I'm doing the, uh, the math 50 days after, you know, December, you know, 10th or 12th, but, uh, you know, you pass through Christmas and new year's, any, any, um, any special celebration you did like on Christmas day, you know, be like on the way through or in that moment. Yes. Uh, now you're speaking to Ben Odom, someone who really loves food. And so most <laughs> of my celebrations had to do with food that we had stored away for special occasions. One thing That's that awesome. you don't get is fresh food. You'll, you'll take some fresh food with you that can kind of survive, uh, in the boat lockers. Mm -hmm. The lockers are below the water line. So they stay relatively cool. See, we brought on things like oranges. We stocked up on those. And as a treat after a tough shift, we'd be like, hey, you want to break out some oranges? So those were special treats. And then for Christmas, we had some very kind previous uh, veteran ocean rowers that knew kind of what we would want. So someone mm. gave me one of those uh, chocolate oranges, those foil wrapped chocolate oranges. Uh, cause I'm a chocolate fan. And then my buddy, Matt really likes, uh, like those fruit gummies. And so, uh, a friend from Switzerland packed a little gift wrap bag of those for him. And it sounds like a simple pleasure, but wow, that was gold, uh, yeah. a couple of weeks in. So that's so cool. Yeah. All right. So take us back. I mean, a few years before this, this wasn't even an idea in your head. One night you have a few too many. Talk about that story. How, how does Matt get you roped into this crazy idea? I am typically not the instigator of such crazy ideas. Although my friends might flag me as that type of person. Really, I, my, my adventures are relatively mild. And I wound up comparing a bucket list one evening in Chicago with my new coworker, Matt. He worked out of Florida. I worked out of Texas and we met for a, for an all hands meeting in, in Chicago. And the experience that we had, it started like this. We, we both like to work out and a lot of, we worked for a fitness company at the time and everyone was talking big about how they were going to go take this fitness class in the morning. And it had a reputation in Chicago for being a bunch of really tough soccer moms and it was called mm -hmm. kick-ass fitness. So this boot camp at five in the morning probably 10 of us signed up. We're going to go, you know, prove ourselves. Well, you know how this goes night of drinking with, with coworkers, Matt and I were the only two from our company that showed up and we nearly got killed by these soccer moms who were extremely fit. And it was just a real high intensity training. And, uh, we were both red in the face, just dying. And I think after we got out of that, we kind of had a, an increased respect for one another for showing up and taking care of business sounds silly. I know, but you know, we, we kind of, uh, took that aside and I guess Matt had decided at that point, like, Hey, Ben is someone I'm going to take with me on this adventure. He had been planning to do this for some time. He brought it to my attention and I just said, what you're going to do what? And I, and I gave it to him like, yeah, that's crazy. I don't think I would ever do that. And I, and it's like, why would people row across the ocean? The problem is, as you know, there are YouTube documentaries out there. I started looking at the 2015 race documentary mm -hmm. and my internal language started changing. I thought, well, that's, that's crazy. You know, wow. That's, that's crazy. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it wasn't long after that Matt hit me up formally and said, Hey, I'm serious. I want you to consider going on this, uh, race with me because I've been looking for the right person and I, I don't know if he was buttering me up, but he said, you're the right person to go with me. And I said, all right, let me give it some thought. And, uh, and I decided to, to join, described it to my wife and she's used to me having, you know, okay, a guy's weekend here, a guy's weekend there doing some hiking. So she said, sure, whatever. <laughs> so, well, let me, let me take you out for coffee. Let's get out the calendar and let me show you what it's really going to be about. And so she gave me the okay. And, and that was that. And it led to two and a half years of some pretty intense preparation and planning. And, um, yeah, the, the toughest part really is getting to the starting line for sure. Yeah. So, so talk about, I mean, so I think, you know, hindsight's 2020 in these types of situations. And you, you mentioned right at the beginning, 
you, you don't know what it's going to be like until you do at least one, right? Like, so, mm -hmm. but knowing what you know now, like what were, what were some of the best things you did mentally, physically to prepare yourself for, for this adventure? I will, I will say that the, what I love so much about this race is that it's not about your physical abilities for the most part. And I love that there are stories littering this race history with the tortoise and the hare examples where I think I mentioned this to you, but there's, a this notorious couple, I don't know their names, probably best, maybe not to name them, mm -hmm. but there's this legend of a husband and wife that set out to the Pacific. And the husband was the tall athletic rower that really kind of goaded his wife into doing it. Well, she was the studious one that took notes during all the training and really did the mental preparation. Like, okay, we're ready to do this. They get out on the water. And at least a week or two in the husband said, Hey, I'm out. Like I'm claustrophobic. I'm losing my mind. Our race is over. Well, and I'll use nice words, but so she said something to the tune of, well, your race is over. And, uh, apparently their marriage is over now, but she finished this race on her own. A petite lady rode a boat made for two across the Pacific ocean to Hawaii. And that, when I heard that story, that's the first time I realized, yeah, this is really a mental game. So you asked about prep. I really started reaching out to as many veteran rowers as I could like describe mm -hmm. to me what it's like. If, did you have a mental breakdown? When, why, what was it like? What was it over? What'd you do to get over it? So anyone that had success, I want to talk to them. And by the same token, my rowing partner, Matt and I, we work in areas of technology where we manage risk. So we wanted to know anyone that had a bad experience or didn't finish, we wanted to know what happened so we could understand yeah. what these failure modes were like. And for the most part, there were some examples where there were just extreme equipment failures and decisions had to be made to like, Hey, are we going to ride this out and just basically float across? Or are we going to go ahead and get rescued? It's a very hard decision to make, I think. And then there were some times where it just, it was a mental issue. Like there was some type of breakdown where someone couldn't recover from the stress of the, of a mental breakdown and they just needed to, to get off. And so that was the, the most important thing I think to prepare for this race is to get an, get a long enough test row, like go out for a week, like find a way to mm. get out on one of the, like get your boat or borrow someone else's and, and go out for a week and see if you see how you do with ocean you know, seasickness, see how you manage the camp, kind of like the camping aspect of it, which is living without, uh, things like a toilet, you know, like using the bucket and making sure that you, you understand what it's going to be about. And then just projecting and simulating your mind, what it would be like to be away from your loved ones, what it'll be like to be isolated. And I, I think that the mental aspect and just using your imagination to really project what that might be like and be, you know, I heard this one too, be so, uh, foolish that you are naive that you start it and be so stubborn that you finish. And I think just that stubbornness of like, Hey, we're going to make this, we're going to figure out a way to do it is, is very important. So that determination and just being ready to suffer and knowing that that's part of the whole game is that you're going to push yourself. You're going to be at your worst sometimes and that's okay. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's easy to, well, it's, it's all the preparation mentally is maybe understanding some of that stuff, knowing some of the parameters of what's happened before, but it, it's all different when it happens to you. So take me to a time in that 50 day, you know, voyage where you kind of, that you hit one of those big like moments where decisions have to be made. Like you guys are really like up against, you know, a challenge. There was one evening in particular nighttime was the hardest for me because sleep deprivation is so prevalent. You, you hit a point within the first few days where you're not sleeping like you're used to. So your body's working more and longer than it's used to. And you're sleeping far less than you're used to, at least for me. Um, I don't have babies anymore. So I get, you know, a full six to eight hours of sleep a night you start operating more in the three to four hours of sleep a night if, if it's a good night. So uh, that had been going on. 
I was dead asleep. The weather had kicked up this particular night. And there's an auto tiller that's a pretty critical piece of your equipment. It steers the rudder of the boat for you automatically based on what's going on. You set a course and it'll stay on that course. And then that allows someone to sleep while the other rower is just out there doing their work. So the weather had kicked up. The auto tiller was having to work extra hard because the boat's getting pushed around and those auto tillers are made for much faster boats. So they have to turn less, you know, it's like gyroscopic force, you know, the faster you're moving, the less this rudder has to move, right. but we're moving so slow that that rudder is having to, to auto correct all the time. And it really works that electric motor. Well, the auto helm or the auto tiller malfunctioned during the middle of my sleep. Uh, a whole nother side story is you pretty much strip down mostly naked when you're off shift in the cabin because you're trying to air everything out. Uh, that's a whole nother aspect of the race is you really have to take care of your skin and uh, be very gentle to it as well to baby it when you're off shift so that when you punish it while you're on shift, it can kind of deal with it. And so I'm half dead asleep, half clothed. The alarm starts going off. The weather's kicked up, the boat's moving all over the place. The auto tillers has malfunctioned. My teammates yelling at me from the deck, trying to give me commands on what to do to, to help him set it straight again, but it had malfunctioned. And so we had to do some quick thinking to understand what the failure mode was. We we're screaming at each other because the weather's so loud. It was really intense period where there's part of you. It's like, man, why am I here? <laughs> like, why am I mm -hmm. dealing with this? And so you just, you have no choice, but just to deal with it. And so you have to adapt. You have to, you have to just, you know, as they say, embrace the suck. Like you're in the middle of that and you have a problem to solve. What I'm very proud about Matt and myself is that, yeah, we, we had plenty of times where we're, our tempers were lost. You know, we weren't exactly speaking very neighborly during some of these stressful moments, but we were very focused on problem solving working together and just a commitment to getting it done yeah. in the entire 50 days, neither of us missed a shift. And so there was definitely a mindset of like, Hey, we're here to work. We're here to do this. And I'm, and, and yeah, sometimes you're really at your worst physically, mentally, and just sleep wise. And you just, it's not motivation. You're, you're not motivated. It's, as I'm sure you've heard Jocko and some other public figures say, like, it's not about motivation at that point. You just don't think about any other option. You don't let your brain entertain you with the option of sleeping in or anything else. You just, you, you signed up for this. Sure, you wanted work. to do it. Just do it. Mm -hmm. Do what the day yeah. requires and be done with it. Yeah. Yeah. They're just the, the idea that, and I think that's, that's easy for people. It would be easy for people to kind of go and let their, their kind of weaker senses like want something so much or dream about or, or kind of justify themselves, you know, s trying to sleep in or just yeah. talk, you know, um, communicating with your, your, you know, battle buddy, like, Hey, just give me an extra hour. I think I, you know, I'll be <laughs> much, you know, but just owning that commitment, owning, like, I got to show up, I got to do the work, got to show up, do the work and just know that, that it's, you know, it's every little rep, every yeah. little r stroke of the, of the, of the row that in you know, the rower that's going to get you guys one inch at a time all the way to the, you know, to the West coast or the yeah. West, you know, the United and, States. And in all humility, you, it's just this intense microcosm of, of humanity where you see each other at the best and the worst. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see yourself. I mean, you, if, if you're self-aware, you know, like, Hey, that right there wasn't my best. And that's, I didn't like it in the moment. But there were times when I immediately saw like, Hey, that wasn't good. It wasn't good enough. You can do better. And you're just coping with, man, that I'm at my worst. And, and I really didn't like how I did in, in that shift or in that moment, there was a time where I felt bad cause I fell asleep on the oars at night. I just literally mm. just kind of <laughs> rocked back and like, boom, uh, just wound up not moving the boat for a while. And that's disappointing. You know, you, you want to do your best at all times. And it's just, I, I look back on it now and I liked that I had that opportunity, even though it's hard to, to look sometimes and, and see 
when you're not at your best, but it's a learning, it's definitely a learning opportunity. Yeah. So what, what would you advise somebody who took this crazy ideas, you know, upon themselves and wanted to do it for themselves? Like what would, what would be your advice? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of advice and the, there's a joke out there in the ocean rowing community that the people you should pay the least attention to are the one time ocean rowers mm -hmm. because they feel like they know everything, but they've only done it once. And it's really a different experience every time. But if I can generalize some advice, it would be that just be ready for everything. Be ready for the good times and the bad times, which will come every day with intensity. Just know that every day will will have usually a bit of everything. Moments that you're really happy, moments that you're terribly sad, <laughs> missing yeah. family, like something will hit you and you're like you're with your own thoughts. And a lot of times you're alone. You know, your partner may be down resting during his off period and you've got two hours just to sit with yourself and your thoughts. And so you do get a lot of headspace for yourself and just got to be ready for all that and make sure you're okay that you, that even if you have like some, I mean, just to be real, like if you have any history of anxiety or other mental illness that might haunt you when, when you're alone, in your own thoughts, just to be ready to cope with that. Mm -hmm. And then from the preparation side, I would, a lot of people tend to do their preparation rows in small chunks, like one day at a time, three days at a mm -hmm. time. And in my opinion, that's not really the best way to go. If I had to do it all over again, like I said, I would get a whole week because you know, if you're staying, if you're at a camp out, that's only a one nighter or a two nighter, are you going to go through all of your hygiene routine that you normally would? Maybe you skip brushing your teeth. Maybe you skip, you know, clipping your toenails. I don't know, whatever, whatever it is, but like, you're not, you're not living, but right. if you're back country camping for two weeks, you're going to have a routine that is, you know, kind of like normal life. So I think getting a training row, that's at least a week long before you set out on this multi month, uh, adventure mm -hmm. is a very important training activity. So it forces you into what a normal routine day to day would look like. Right. And I think you also would start to experience some of the, the similar types of fatigue, whether it's sleep deprivation, yeah. you know, grip, you know, the, the, the blisters, the, mm -hmm. you know, the neck tightening up the back yeah. sore, you know, all those things. I mean, I, I'm six, four, all I can think about is like my low back, like sitting in that position, my hip flexors, I'd be all trying to stretch, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's so many things that could go wrong physically, not just fatigue, not just blisters on your hands, but like your body just not wanting to be in a seated position or, you know, now here's crouch. a little tidbit that you might not yeah. expect. I suffer from a compression and, and aging. Like I've been a desk jockey for so long in the computer industry that my back mm -hmm. is really not healthy, my lower back. And I've tried mm -hmm. to, you know, later in life, I realized, oh, wow, I need to, I need to really be on top of my core strength. I need to, you know, do some physical activity to really yeah. get my core strength and support my lower back. The ocean is amazing in my opinion, because you're not on a static rower, you know, you're not sitting flat, you're moving like this all the time. And so the first week of rowing, I could literally hear my back popping constantly and just almost like the rust getting kicked out of a joint. And I felt great. My lower yeah. back felt amazing. And what's sore, of course, is everything else that you're using, you know, your, sure. your back muscles and shoulder and, and arms and hands. And it was such a revelation that I got off the ocean and thought, man, I need to try to replicate that. So I'm one of those weirdos that sits on a yoga ball now. And, uh, it's, it's been really nice. Like it, it, it keeps my core active and it, so the, so the ocean was really kind to my lower back and just not everything else. So, yeah. That's a great point. I mean, it's like because of the instability, your body mm -hmm. had to find stability oh, yeah. and, and the fluidity kind of probably just allowed all those core muscles in your back to kind of settle into a very healthy equilibrium. That's, that's a great point. Uh, all right. So talk about the race specifically, you know, obviously you you guys were the, it was your first race or your first time across the Atlantic. There were probably, there you said there were about 35 boats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, are you close to these people at all? Or is it, are you like, is it you and, and Matt and like 
the ocean, right? Like, are you looking around and just there's nothing but ocean in every single direction? 99.9% of the time, yes. Not another vessel in sight. The first day or two of the race, we did, we were both passed and we passed other ocean rowing boats that were on the same course. Right. But we, after those first two days, we did not see another ocean rowing boat until we got into the harbor, uh, English Harbor in Antigua. Um, and we, our race was interesting because within our, within our class of pairs rowers, we had hoped to be relatively competitive. There were some strong competitors that we knew. There was a team that were two lifelong sailors that had raced together on large uh, sailboats. So we had a feeling that they would do pretty well. But we thought, hey, maybe maybe we've got a chance for second. You know, maybe we maybe we can really just like get in there and muscle our way through it. And because we had no ocean experience, but we had you know gym experience, endurance experience, we figured we we could compete that way. As long as well, there our, wasn't two ladies from the uh, from the <laughs> soccer moms boot camp, you, you'd be that's good. right, that's right. But we had an unfortunate beginning to our race while we were in kind of the fog of war of adjusting to everything. We just made some navigation missteps that put us in the wrong position and actually had us lagging towards the back of the race. And it was a tough wake up because I remember waking up one morning and we we got calls from our we had a weather router that we had hired to help us weather route along the way. Mm -hmm. And we had a couple of frantic text, text messages from her on the sat phone saying, what are you doing? You guys are going to like, call me, call me. So we realized, oh no, we've, we've definitely put ourselves in a bad position. So we had to claw our way back from the very, almost the back of the race really. And it was tough to start, but once we had like some attitude adjustments said, Hey, you know what? This is what we're going to do now. We're just going to grind and just keep at it. A lot of credit to my partner, who is basically the Terminator, uh, mm. just super strong. And, you know, he's got that farm strength that I call it, you know, where just someone's yeah. naturally strong. And we just, we wound up making eventually our way to third place within the pairs team. And it was fun. You know, the chase, the chase part of it was fun. Yeah. My mother was uh, watching, they call them dot watchers. The people that watch these little dots on the race in the, in the radar tracking, uh, app. And yeah, we, we got little updates from my mom every night on how we were doing. And so it was pretty, that was pretty exciting. And so we knew where other races were at. We had internet capabilities at spotty time. So, uh, in a really nice boat, you see those like round, uh, domes they'll have like a satellite dish inside of them that has gyro, uh, motorized gyroscopes that keep it positioned at all times to the right um, angle. Yeah. Well, we had one of those, but just the dish in our hand and one of us would, you know, with one hand, you've got it pointed. It makes a little audio training signal. You kind of know where to point it. Okay. Then on your other hand, you've got your internet device, like your phone or whatever, you've got connected to WhatsApp to try to get some messages back and forth, a little bit of video here and there. Um, so we'd keep updated that way and that, so we really didn't yeah. see any other boats, but we knew more or less how the other teams were doing by satellite phone or by getting internet updates when we, whenever we were online. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's talk about that feeling, you know, obviously you're, you're pulling into English Harbor in mm -hmm. Antigua, you know, your third place, you, you, thir you know, not 50 days into this incredible trek. Like, what is that feeling? Kind of so a few days out, you can start you. seeing the lights. That's oh, when really? you really get excited because you know, you're getting close, but you've been at it so long. You're the perspective of time, like your perception of time is all messed up and you just don't, you don't really know. You don't have an understanding, but once you see the lights of the Island, mm -hmm. uh, about two days out, we could see the lights at night. That was exciting because we knew by the size of the lights, which islands were where. Yeah. And we could see Antigua and that was pretty exciting. And again, me being very food motivated, I was the cook on the boat. And so every morning I had a routine where I'd pop out and I'd get our breakfast ready. I'd even make coffee every morning and then hand, hand Matt his coffee while he was finishing up his rowing. And I was both excited and a little sad because the morning that we got in, I was ready to make breakfast and he said, we're not making breakfast today. He called me compadre. He's like, we're not, 
we're not breaking, making breakfast today, compadre. We're rowing in. I'm like, but I'm, but I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so that, so that was when I knew it was game on. Uh, it was, you know, the better part of the morning rowing in and that was just some sensory overload. Uh, the coast guard came out to, to meet us and kind of guide us in. Check your passport, stuff like that. Make sure you <laughs> <Yeah>. weren't illegal. <laughs> and it was, it was wild. There's a little, uh, ruins of a castle kind of on an overlook in the Harbor. And I could see little dots that turned out to be my family. Uh, mm. that was something else. And yeah. one of the safety directors, his name's Ian. He is kind of like the tough headmaster when you're preparing for the race. He, he's the yeah. one with the big, long checklist that if you're not ready, you'll get in trouble and maybe he won't even let you race. That's happened before, mm -hmm. but it was crazy to see him because he just turns into this maniac cheerleader. He's got flares going, he's screaming. And so it's, and then all the super yachts in the Harbor start, start, uh, you know, blowing their horns and it's just wild. And that's when you see these pictures of people like popping their flares when they hit the finish line. Yeah. And it was, it's a second to none feeling it's, you know, I've, I've finished other, you know, endurance races and this is, it was like nothing else. Knowing that your family is right there at the dock, knowing yeah. that you're done with this 50 day effort, uh, and you're about to get a cold beer and some food and some hugs and kisses. It was uh, phenomenal. It was really, it, it was a, just sensory overload. And my buddy, Matt, the Terminator, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't cry, but I think he might have shed a tear or two when, uh, when we hit that finish line. <laughs> yeah, you know, you think about somebody completing a marathon, right? And, it, mm -hmm. you know, it's three, four hours of, of the grueling running. And just the elation they feel or somebody does an ultra marathon, hundred miles, maybe a 24 hour race. Right. Uh, I interviewed a, um, marathon canoe racer, you know, 36 hours to complete this, you know, river race, you know, and just how, you know, how long and arduous that was, but it, it seems like the farther along, you know, the farther the distance, the longer that you have to kind of persevere and go through yeah. like 50 days, <laughs> the. I mean, there's something about it. I mean, you know, it's, it's like hiking the Appalachian trail or something, you know, where it's mm -hmm. like, it may not be, you're not, you're not running at a, at a marathon sprint, the whole, you know, you're not trying to get a world record, but you're, you're doing something that takes so much effort, focus, day-to-day -day commitment that, I mean, I can only imagine how special it would be to just, and then to see your family, like <laughs> sitting there, standing there on the castle, like waving you in and what an, what an accomplishment. I just. I, I admire your, your bravery and everything that you, you know, craziness in order to do it, but also just the, the story that you bring back with you. Cause I think it's a testament to the human spirit and to you and, and Matt together as, as a, you know, as a partnership. It's addictive. So just be careful. You know, you, know, I, you spend too I, much I time looking it. at it. You might sign up. I, and I was, I was impressed. <laughs> I was, you know, you watch, you watch these videos and these really, you know, impressive things that are happening. You're like, Hmm, I wonder if that would be something I could do. Well, and, and this is, and, and I don't mind saying this. Yes. You have to be a certain level of crazy to do it. You have to, you have to have a lot of stubbornness, I think, because it's so, I mentioned that the prep is the hardest. It really is. Yeah. We hit so many administrative obstacles to get to the starting line that we could spend a whole hour talking about that. But in summary, Customs was a nightmare for the U.S. teams that year. Mm -hmm. We were a week and a half delayed getting our boats to the starting line. So that meant usually you have two weeks to prep at the starting line. Yeah. And that is you get your boat out of the container ship, you get it all settled, you trim it, make sure it's like balanced on the water. You, you double check your rations that you've packed what you needed, where you want it. You kind of practice your daily routine to make sure you're race ready. We got our boats two days before the race started. Barely, there was a lot of talk about, would we even make the race? So there was all, so f from the start of our two and a half year prep to just before the race started, there were so many obstacles and, and pitfalls, you know, this is not my story to tell. So I'm going to just say a few limited things about it, but my partner, Matt almost didn't make it on the plane to La Gomera. He had kind of a family, um, event happen that that really put in question whether or not he would make it 
on the plane with me and I was faced with maybe I would be doing it solo or not at all. There were just right up until the very start of the race, so many reasons to back out or to say yeah. no or to, or to delay it. And I think that's true for almost everyone. Like everyone I've talked to agrees. Yes. Getting to the starting line is the most challenging part. And, and yes, it, the it race has its challenges. Yeah. yeah. But it galvanizes like, you know, there's all these reasons to say, Oh, maybe this is not right. Maybe, maybe we don't need to do like, you know, if there's something in the back of your mind that's telling you, like, mm, this is a bad idea, like, why am I doing this? All those create opportunities for someone to just, like, eh, maybe next year, let, let's not push this. Maybe it's not right. And so you actually get in that boat and you get on the water and you start that voyage. Like, you've already said yes so many times. Yep. If, if I'm, if, you know, the way I hear your story, I love that. Cause then it just makes it easier and easier to say yes every morning, every shift, every time you pick up the rower. Mm -hmm. Or the, yeah, the oars. Yeah, so. as you well are well aware, there's you know the half empty or the half full way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. And even when it got really tough, my mantra was like, "Hey, I wanted this. I worked really hard to suffer here. <laughs> like, I wanted this opportunity to prove myself out here, and I'm glad that I have it. And I'm just suffering through right now, and this is what I paid for. So it's definitely healthier to look at it that way, I think, so that you can enjoy." the and kind of enjoy the experience all including the suffering yeah well and you, you did it for a cause talk about that real quick this what, what were you guys were doing a uh, kind of a fundraiser along with this voyage yeah it's a tradition for the race for teams to pick a charity to fundraise for as as part of the effort mm -hmm. and um so for example the the team i'm supporting today is two in a row they uh they race this year and it's a pairs team and they're fundraising for children's cancer in the UK. We, we looked around and, and frankly, we were inexperienced with fundraising. We knew that. And so we wanted to find a partner that would help us along the way where we wouldn't have to do all the work. And what we found is that for an unknown quantity like ourselves, we couldn't just pick up the phone and call large national networks. And I don't want to call them out because I respect these national um, charities but we just couldn't get through. Uh, we were being put into a there's, long there's queue. There's a firewall. Like, yeah, like we'll get to you in six months maybe, or maybe not. So we wound up calling Make-A-Wish Foundation because I knew them to be very localized. Mm -hmm. And so we talked to Make-A-Wish Foundation in Austin and in Florida. And we wound up mostly fundraising for Florida. And then some we did for Austin as well. And if for those that aren't familiar, Make-A-Wish Foundation... When I, when I first heard about them, I was kind of skeptical that, well, if I'm donating money towards fundraising, shouldn't it be for cancer research and other very practical matters? Uh, and then I had a friend who said, Hey, let me tell you about make a wish. And they had a child go through the program and they kind of explained how this notion of a delightful experience that kind of breaks the routine for someone that's going through a serious illness is has a very practical effect of motivating them of like lifting up their spirits so that they can go through all those practical things that they're going through treatments and and hospital stays so it, it inspired me to to look at make a wish foundation and because they're so local the our chapter in jacksonville florida they were really excited to pick up the phone and get to know us once they found out what we we're doing they got really excited. We had some local events with them. We went to their fundraisers. We brought the boat out. People loved getting in it. And especially the kids liked seeing well, what's this weird boat. Ooh, I want to be in a boat. So it was a lot of fun. And it's, it's tough to speak about this, but I'll just say we got to meet some wish kids that had been through some really tough things. Yeah. So and that's awesome. I'm glad you I'm glad that was a part of this, you know, that you get to connect that way you see that and then you realize like, Hey, what I'm doing is nothing like yeah. these kids. They're, they're suffering through this trial and I can go row this ocean boat. Like I'm, I'm fine. So that was a source of motivation and inspiration for us to, to kind of continue. And, and like, good Lord, you can't quit. You can't quit on these kids. Like, <laughs> no come way. on now. Like, could you imagine? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like those, you know, I think it's so special when like families are backing you, you've got this, you know, cause that you're a part of people are, 
you know, you might be getting letters from people who are just inspired by your story. Yeah. And then those are just like tentacles, like, like a, a part of this journey. It's not like you're out there doing something. Nobody knows what you're doing. You could do it or not. Nobody care. Like you're, you're a part of a community and you're leading that, that story. And I think that just makes it that much more fun, that yeah. much more rewarding for everybody. Yeah, I, I agree. And it really, you know, it, random connections all over the place to people that were excited about what we're doing. So we're very humbled by that. We had vendors that helped us out once they realized what we were up to. Yeah. They would, without us even asking, they would give us discounts or benefits and help, help us get the things that we needed to go on the way. Right. We had lots of people chip in in that way. And it was very humbling, uh, made us very grateful and, and it made them all part of that community. And we, mm -hmm. we did our best to have our, our family keep up all the social media action while we we're out on the boat, sharing videos and dad jokes and some other stuff that we did while we we're on the boat. It was a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah. I, I actually heard about you guys cause uh, a mutual friend, uh, JP Juarez was like sending me your, your, some Facebook uh, posts to be like, you gotta listen. These guys are amazing. When they get <laughs> back, you gotta do it. You gotta interview this guy. And so, yeah, I was kind of like, you know, heard and look, getting a little bit more information about you and what this whole thing was. And then he's like, Benton's back. Gotta call him. <laughs> so, now anyway, JP was shout great. Out to JP. And so was Camp Gladiator for that matter. Um, I know you're involved with Camp Gladiator and I'll just mm -hmm. give a shout out that they, uh, during the pandemic, everything was in disarray. We had our title sponsor back out. We had, we had a lot of obstacles related to the pandemic. At the same time, it's not a very easy time to ask for fundraising when so many people we knew were struggling financially because of the disarray that COVID brought on the economy. And one of those things was just the gym environment. You know, we had our gym shut down that we were at for a while. I had poked fun at some, I can't let air friends saying, you know, you can work out in air conditioning if you want. And, uh, then I came back during the pandemic and said, Hey, can I, can, can you bring me along to camp gladiator? And that's how I met JP. And he was a great support. So was Camp Gladiator in terms of just staying fit during an unsure time. Uh, you know, we could work out outside. It was great. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, love, love that piece of the story too. <laughs> well, Hey Ben, I appreciate you, man. I, I, you know, next time you talk to Matt, you, you tell him, you know, he's a badass and he signed wait, up you know. to do it again. He's doing oh, the Pacific. Of course he did. The he's doing the Pacific. That's right. Yeah, Fortune yeah. Cookies are doing the Pacific Race this coming summer. And that's that's from Japan to... Uh, that's to from Monterey Hawaii. Bay. That's uh, Monterey just... Monterey Bay, okay. Yeah. Oh, the, so, the, so California. California to Kauai. So, to Kauai, uh, okay. So about 3,000 miles just in a different ocean. Yeah, a little, little, probably a little choppier maybe. It's tough to get off the continental shelf from what I hear. It's a, it's a yeah. real whiz-bang start to the race. You stay wet and windy for a while, yeah. Yeah. Well, Van, I can't wait to, to get this out. Let people hear your story. Uh, thanks again for everything. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Barton. Uh, yeah, man. And man, I'm telling you, you, uh, if you start getting bitten by the bug, just let me know. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll hook you up with all the inside knowledge. And, and your, and your story about the, uh, the super athletic rower who like bailed after a week. Like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, like it can't be me. I can't be that guy. I gotta, yeah, you know, if you're yeah. in it, you gotta be all in. So that's right.